Hi there, you're listening to the Bigfoot Society Podcast, and I'm Jeremiah Byron. Every week I talk to individuals who have experienced Sasquatch in some way or another, so you won't want to miss an episode. Make sure you're subscribed on the platform that you're listening to, and share this episode with a friend. It does not cost a thing, and it helps the show continue to grow. If you'd like to hear Bigfoot Society episodes early and ad-free, you can do so by becoming a Patreon supporter or a YouTube channel member. Links to those are in the show notes. And Bigfoot Society, I've taken far too much of your time so far, so let's get on with the show. All right, Bigfoot Society, we've got the privilege of talking to Mr. Fred Roll tonight. Uh, Fred, this is a uh, going to be a fun interview. I've never had an individual be requested so many times for me to get them on the podcast. Literally, probably three to four times a day in the comments, I get someone saying, "You need to have Fred from Alaska. You need to have Fred from Subarctic Alaska Sasquatch Channel come on and talk about Alaska Hairy Man." So I'm just so. Uh, happy to finally get you on, Fred. How are you doing tonight? Well, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, fantastic. And just to give, uh, there may be some listeners that, you know, don't know about you yet, but if if you're not following and subscribe to Subarctic Alaska Sasquatch channel on YouTube, you really need to make sure that you do uh, right after this. Uh, it's pretty cool because you're reporting, you're recording uh, Alaskan hairy man encounters, uh, your First Nations Alaska native and uh, your tribal council member from Dillingham, Alaska, which is uh, just awesome that you have that connection. You can really be uh, connected to the the stories that that you are uh, recording and reporting. So uh, it's just it's it's awesome, Fred. And uh, remind me uh, the the area that you are uh, based out of is is it Dillingham then? I'm, I'm from there. I'm from Bristol Bay. Uh, I currently live in Wasilla, Alaska. There, there's no uh, job opportunities in Bristol Bay unless it's seasonal because a lot of the, the good jobs there, whether it be hospital or otherwise, are already taken. So it's, it's just not a very uh, financially viable place to live year round. Mm, gotcha. Yeah. And it, from what I've gathered from other interviews, it, it's it can be a pretty uh, hostile environment to live in Alaska, but it is a beautiful environment, but it's also uh, a very, it can be a very unforgiving. Uh, you don't get too many chances up there. Yeah. Uh, like I tell people all the time, Alaska don't care. Uh, it, it really don't. It, it, it's irrelevant what you're prepared for. It, you never know what you're going to get up here. It's, it's, it's always different. Mm. Absolutely. You know, I'd I'd be curious, Fred. What was it that that first brought you into being so interested and involved with recording and reporting these encounters? Do you remember a time in your life when you were first introduced to this concept of the Alaskan hairy man? Oh, geez, I was a little kid. Uh, my auntie, uh, when we were young, uh, we always had fish camp, hunting camp and so on in the village. And when we were really young, we were too young to participate in pulling and hauling nets and picking fish. So one of our aunties would watch us during those months. And, you know, like, especially my aunt Lucy, she was, uh, one of the most boisterous and outspoken people when it came to watching out for the hairy man, because it, it wasn't just, um, mythological folklore. It was, uh, a fact of life, just no different than beware of a moose at the end of the driveway. It may stop you to death type of thing. So she would always warn us about, you know, uh, don't follow strange whistles into the woods. Don't go into the woods alone. Uh, don't turn your back on the woods. Don't be out after dark. Uh, the hairy man will get you. You know, and as a kid hearing these things, you know, over and over, you know, being a little kid, I, I thought I was savvy. And I thought they were just trying to keep us from having fun. And so in 1983, 
I remember it clearly. I, I snuck away from the group that was in the front yard of my grandma's house. Uh, her property was right at the end of the runway uh, next to the Dillingham Airport at the time by Squaw Creek side. And I, I snuck away from the group because I wanted to work on my tree fort. And so I'm approximately about 120 yards away from my grandma's house on this little trail. And it was open, but uh, about 70 yards in front of me, there was a, a big bunch of willows. And they were about 10, 12 foot tall, roughly. And I had my path I had to take through those willows to get to where I was building my tree fort. And I was about 70 yards from it. And so I was staring at my feet at the time. I remember it clear as day and something just told me, look up. And when I looked up, I saw this big shadow in the willows. And I immediately, my, my uncle Leo was like 6'2". So I, I thought it was him at first. And I thought, oh, crap, I'm going to be in trouble. And it wasn't my uncle Leo. Uh, this thing screamed at me. Uh, the most blood curdling, just scary thing I dealt with at that time. And I turned around and, and ran back. Um, of course, I got in trouble for it and whatnot. And then a little bit later that season in the fall, we went up the Michigan River on a 32 foot Ross and fishing boat. And we used that as our base camp for moose hunting at the end of fishing season because uh, my family was deeply involved in commercial salmon fishing. And so we would use that big boat as our base camp, we would anchor out in the river and use a small skiff to go and get our moose and whatnot. And we had this A-frame built in the back of it on the stern side to where we had a tarp over it and we could hang our moose meat and it wouldn't get rained on and it could hang and all that kind of stuff, right? So we were on our way back from um, hunting camp, basically. And there was a handful of us younger cousins, a, a few older cousins that were in their mid to late teens and uh, two of my uncles and my dad. And we got stuck on a gravel bar just at Black Bluff by Angel Bay, which is the tidal area of the Nushigak going in the Nushigak Bay from the river. And it, it's right where the fresh water meets the, the ocean water. And we were stuck. There was no way we were getting up until the tide came in. And so one of my older cousins, after a little while, uh, the adults were stressing that they, you know, they didn't want the boat to tip over and then potentially, you know, take on water when the tide comes in. So they were working things out, you know, how to stabilize the boat and all this. So it didn't tip or whatever. But one of my older cousins was like, let me get the younger kids out of your hair. I'll take them sport fishing, you know, with rod and reel in the skiff and, you know, get them out of your hair, basically. So we all got our fishing poles into the skiff and we're backing away from the boat and there was a lot of commotion because you got the outboard running you got the adults on the boat still talking and uh we us kids we were just concerned about fishing you know we're all excited or whatever and there was this screaming going on but we we weren't putting two and two together and then we were hearing the splashing going on and my dad and my uncles were sitting there screaming waving us back we came back to the stern of the boat and immediately they were taking us kids off as quickly as possible. And when we all got on, on deck and we were going into the, uh, basically the cabin of the boat where the, you know, the wheelhouse is, uh, the screaming was really, really loud. And we noticed because one of our other cousins was pointing up to the black bluff, which was about 70 yards away and about 65 feet above us roughly. and there was a silhouette up there of a hairy man and he was screaming and started throwing rocks. And, you know, everyone, they were concerned of course, cause it's throwing rocks, but none of the rocks were hitting the boat yet. And then one hit broke through the tarp and hit a piece of a uh, uh, loose hind quarter that was hanging there so hard. It, it snapped off of its line and fell to the deck and immediately they, rushed us downstairs and you know there was a bunch of gunfire going on and we'd hear screaming rocks thrown and you know another volley of fire and it that was basically uh where the reality of what we were dealing with really sunk in as far as the dangers because seeing something at a distance versus seeing its aggression or you know the potential of that aggression you know play out in front of you is really really eye-opening but we ended up 
you know, sequestered down even lower into the sleeping quarters, which wasn't very big. And I, I couldn't tell you how long the screaming and the gunshots went on, but it went on for a while because they would shoot it. It would fall down. It would get right back up and, and throw more rocks from what I heard later. And eventually we fell asleep down, you know, down underneath there. And when we woke back up, we were at the, you know, Dillingham Boat Harbor. And, you know, my uncles and my dad were telling my mom and aunties, you know, everything that happened and whatnot. But that that was some of the most intense portions of my childhood. There, there was other sightings, you know, berry picking and whatnot. And something a lot of people don't realize, uh, I was talking to someone from the village earlier today. Uh, our heritage is so steeped in, in these supposed mythological folklore, whatever you want to call it. But it's day-to-day life. In, in for a lot of villagers, even to this day. And it's it's hard to convey that sometimes because a lot of people, they're raised, you know, Boy Scouts and, you know, they get out to national parks to get their fill of getting into the woods and whatnot. And up here, you step outside, you know, uh, we don't have any park boundaries that animals abide by. I, I get moose, bear, fox, all that. They come through my yard. You know what I mean? So, it's a different dynamic up here. It's totally different. And when it comes to like things like the hairy man, little people, uh, you know, Kustika, whatever you want to call the otter man, there's moose man. There's a bunch of different stories, if you want to call it that, but they're all based in reality. And I think a lot of people just chalk that up to, oh, that's just mythological talk. That's just, you know, keep kids in line and this and that. And and it's not the case because I I know of many villagers that could go on for days about hairy man experiences they've had or their relatives have had or, you know, so on and so forth. So it's it's really, it's basically day-to-day life for a lot of people in the village. That story you just told me, it sounded like so. Did they actually hit the hairy man with their with their shots? Do you think? Oh, yeah, a hundred percent, one hundred percent. It according to what I was told later, uh, it just kept getting back up and throwing more rocks. Wow. Uh, we come from a long line of, of subsistence hunters. Uh, we when we're when we're shooting, it's not braggadocia. We we shoot to kill and make it quick it's you know we're not out there to take 20 shots on an animal just to wound it we're we're from uh the mindset of one shot one kill a lot my dad's a vietnam vet my uncles were non vets they they're well versed when it comes to shooting and the distance that thing was wasn't all that far wow the stories that you've heard over the years has anyone actually been able to successfully uh, shoot one so that it will be, you know, they got a specimen or, or is it a thing where you'll try to shoot it and every time it just keeps getting back up? Well, no, I, I've, uh, I shared a story that, uh, a Clinkett elder shared with me. His name was Thomas. He's since passed. But uh, he happened to have a dispatch, we'll call it uh, three of them over the course of a decade. Uh, one, one time, the first time was in the Tongass. Uh, they were there for a logging job and what have you. Uh, the second time was up the Copper River Valley. And the third time was between Selwick and Calstag, uh, where, they, where he dispatched one. and. What he relayed to me, and this was just about a year ago that he had shared this with me, or a little over a year, uh, it, it was a headshot uh, through the ear or in the eye. That was the only way to get them to stay down and basically die. Uh, the first one they buried, the second one they burned, and the third one, uh, he claimed that he had cut it up and disposed of its body parts, some of it in a cave and its torso uh, back at the end of a valley. So there's that, 
you know, uh, this, this gentleman was in his nineties. He had nothing to gain, you know, by sharing that he was mainly just trying to, uh, educate me, uh, because I told him my experience and how my shots were ineffective. And that's when he stopped me and was like, you got to shoot him in the soft tissue, neck, eyes, ear, you know, something like that in order to get them to basically stop. That is extreme. Wow, that's extremely detailed in in ways I've never heard before on that show. And you said Klinka Elter, and uh, that reminds me. Yeah, I've talked to a gentleman before. It was that close to Prince of Wales Island. Uh, not horribly far from it. Mm. I think the the Klinka Elders were involved with that area too, from what I remember. But the, the Southeast Alaska uh, area is is very intense. With um, uh, I believe there's they say there's tribes of four toed um, Sasquatch that are seen down there. Is that anything that you've run into before in any stories that you've uh, yeah, gathered? I've, yeah, I've heard those accounts. Yeah, I've heard of those accounts. Um, <laughs> I talked to. Uh, natives from all across the state mm. um and you know you get you get accounts of three toes four toes five and even six toes but typically when you hear of the six toe prints they're like 24 inches long and a good foot wide so to me that's uh, more along the lines of what we'd call a mountain giant and there's accounts of those as well uh and you still hear accounts from up near ruby uh, up on the Yukon where villagers will hear the trumpeting of like elephants and they claim to have seen mammoth in recent history within the last decade. That is something I would love to explore <laughs> to, to see a woolly mammoth live and in person, just out in the middle of nowhere. That would be an experience. That's incredible. So you've actually, you've talked to people that have personally encountered uh, like the sounds of, of woolly mammoths you're saying, or. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, villagers from Ruby and Galena right on the Yukon river, uh, uh, within 15 miles of the river is what I was told. Man, that's wild. I mean, you, you never know the stories you hear out of the Yukon and I've heard other things as well. And just that area is so remote, so wild. Uh, Man, it's 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 crazy, and you'd mount you'd mention yeah, yeah. mountain giants as well. <laughs> Man, that's a, that's a new one I hadn't heard of either. Right, there was a guy. Uh, he was spotting for moose or caribou. I forget what it was, but he said he had you know he had one of those big old uh, I, I forget the power on it, but it was one of those huge spotting scopes where you can easily see a mile away. You know what I mean? And he was spotting. And he noticed this big grayish green thing moving and it looked like it was trees on its back. And he said it was about 30 foot tall and it had like a mane going down its back. It was grayish green, had hair down its forearms and kind of cuffed around its wrist and was a little longer around the wrist. The hair was, uh, he said the back kind of reminded him of a, uh, snapping turtle, you know, with the splines on the back or whatever. Sure. And he said it kind of looked like that, but it was more like a bristly type of hair down the back. It had tusks from the lower jaw protruding up next to the nostrils. And uh, he said it just moved nonchalant. And he was just in awe watching this thing from roughly a mile away. And he heard a bush plane in the distance. And he looked to find out where the plane was. And he spotted the plane. Then he looks back. And this thing... As he looked back, he saw just the, the tail end of this thing crunching down to the ground, and it blended in perfectly with the scenery. So when this thing was moving, it heard the plane as well and just kind of laid low, stayed still, and, and you wouldn't even see it. That's incredible, man. I wonder yeah. if anyone has ever captured uh actual like video evidence or, or anything of, of creatures like that is that's a new subject for me, man. Well, I, I've personally seen uh, footage of little people. I've personally seen 
way better footage uh, in 4K resolution of a Sasquatch. Uh, there's a homestead down on the peninsula, and these people contacted me uh, about a year ago. Uh, they had started getting goats because they, you know, they wanted goats to keep the land clear, you know, the undergrowth kind of, you know, to a minimum. And they had a couple small pens. And they had just basically started their homestead on about uh, five to six acres, roughly. And one of their goats came up missing one day. And so the husband went out, kind of looked around, saw some weird tracks, thought it was a double bear impression, you know. And so, okay, it's a bear. So he kind of went outside of the property, scouting around, couldn't really find anything, no blood trail, no sign of this missing goat, comes back. That evening, he saw a dark shadow in the trees and just fired around up into the trees to scare whatever this large looming thing was. He assumed it was a bear on his hind feet. Well, the thing disappeared. No harm, no foul kind of thought process. And the next morning when they were drinking coffee at their table, uh, they heard a loud, just this monstrous scream that ended in a high pitch. And this thing, it took their second goat ripped it in half and threw both halves at the cabin one after another and that got their attention because they heard the scream they saw what was left of the goat smacked up against their cabin and so once it got a little lighter outside he went out to investigate nothing was going on it was dead quiet he got rid of the remains of the goat and kind of looked for more sign of what the hell this was uh, they had called the authorities at that point. The authorities told them, hey, bears are around, you know, keep your goats close, put up electrical fence, you know, just basically shine them on. W wasn't listening to the scream part of it. They just just blew it off. And later on that day, uh, he was out in their front yard with his daughter. And this is rustic. It was freshly cleared. So it's not like they had a manicured lawn or anything, but they did have a fence up. It was about 40 feet from their front window where the fence started and that was basically their front lawn and he was out there with his daughter and they heard a scream and so he stood still put his daughter behind him and on video the video portion i saw was the wife recording from inside uh from a little sony handy cam and this sasquatch walked between that fence and this guy who had his daughter behind him, and this thing was looking at him with such disdain and like hatred, like he wanted to, to end him, but he, for some reason he couldn't kind of look. And it, you can see clearly on video, this thing just walked on by, stepped over the fence and went off into the trees. I tried for months to get them to release that footage anonymously. I told them I'd leave their names out, I'd blur faces, I would do whatever I had to do to make them at ease to release this footage, and, and they wouldn't budge. And, you know, I wasn't going to put on a bunch of high-pressure tactics that was their footage, it was their thing, I just left it at that. Uh, but I, I, I still wish I could get my hands on that footage, because, you know, the, the Patterson-Gimlin footage is, is great, but this is on a different level of clarity you you can see the muscle movement clearly you can damn near count individual hairs on this thing and its face uh was very defined very clear it, it, it was just amazing footage and unfortunately you know they they want no part of it they want not even anonymously they that they want to share they were just asking my advice on how to keep them away from their property and that, that's as far as they wanted to take it unfortunately that is, that is a shame, but you do have to respect, you know, uh, as they are the owners of the footage, but it sounds like footage like that could, could totally, you know, to a lot of people could prove the existence of the creature. I would imagine. I mean, it would probably make a few people change their mind, but wow. Oh, yeah. Oof. Yeah, and it's intense. I saw it with my own eyes in their cabin, in the same living room they filmed it from. And that, <laughs> I, I tried to, you know, uh, I was trying to be as, uh, you know, unintrusive as possible, but firm in trying to express to them, look, a lot of people can gain from this, not financially, but just knowledge wise on 
the realities of what you're dealing with. You know, it, it could lead to more help because the best I could tell you is, you know, maybe put up some IR floodlights and, you know, stay in at night. You know, that's that's the best advice I could give, you know, outside of outright shooting the thing. And they wanted no part of that either. Uh, I offered to come in with a, a team of guys and, and take a look around. They wanted no part of that. Uh, you know, they, they were basically hoping that I had the silver bullet, so to speak, for their situation and, you know, would make it all go away. But unfortunately, I don't have that, you know. Can you describe, you know, when you looked at that, that video and you saw that footage, what did you see in the face of the creature? Uh, it looked more Neanderthal than eight. Uh, very similar to what I saw in 06, just not quite as big. This thing was about 10 foot tall. Uh, I would say the shoulders, uh, shoulder width, uh, just by simple, just looking at the footage and the husband's height, I would say the shoulders are about four, four and a half foot wide. Arms hung down just, you know, just above the knee, uh, the forearm was longer than the upper arm. The hands were huge. Uh, the jaw uh, was really big, wide, and pronounced. Uh, you could tell that uh, its teeth, if it were showing them, uh, would it protruded out further than the nose. Uh, ash gray colored skin, pitch black eyes, real wrinkly faced. Uh, you could tell under the hair with the movement, uh, the muscle definition was like, uh, these bodybuilders you see that are just, you can see every sinew and every fiber of muscle under their skin. It was very similar to that, just coated in this hair. It was about four, four and a half inches long for the most part, but the upper part of the head had a little bit of longer hair. So it would, it would look like half rocker style on the hair on the, on the head, but then it, you know, it all went down to a shorter length on the rest of its body. Uh, the genitalia was basically covered by hair. Uh, you, you couldn't, you, you could tell it was a big male, but it wasn't like it's junk was hanging or anything like that. It, it was just a lot of hair in that area. Uh, the upper part of the leg looked longer than the lower part. And you could easily see in the footage when it was stepping, because I, I, I got the opportunity to watch it about four or five different times. You could see the foot almost looked like it was flopping because of that mid torsal break, the way it was walking. Uh, just an anthropologist would, would kill their firstborn to have this footage to study. It, it was, it, it's great. And I told them if they weren't going to share it, I would, I would destroy it. just what I told them because I, I, I would never, you know, give away their name or their exact location. I, I, I just wouldn't betray them like that. But, you know, I, I tried to reach out to them uh, just a few months ago to see how they were doing, but I didn't get a response. Uh, you know, I think for a lot of people, uh, once they get some kind of confirmation that they're not crazy, uh, they want nothing more to do with it. I agree with you. That lines up with, you know, people I've talked to is a lot of times they just want to share what they've experienced so they can go to sleep at night and feel like they're not crazy. I totally get it. Um, my goodness. Right. I mean, on my channel right now, I have 172 videos. Mm. <clears throat> if I was able to share every encounter shared with me that, you know, if they were open to it, even if they remained anonymous, I would have four or 500 encounters on my channel. It's just a lot of people, they want to talk to someone who ain't going to judge them and get it off their chest. And it seems like a lot of them, once they get it off their chest, they, they can let it go, so to speak. They, you know, for some people speaking it out loud, uh, cause a lot of the people I interview, I talk to them three, four or five times just so I get their encounter down. So when I relay it in a video, I can give the finer details. I can walk them, you know, the viewer through it to where they feel like they're in that place at that time. And, you know, talking to the people, it, it, it helps me for one, it's kind of like a form of therapy, but also it helps the listener to better understand, you know, 
terrain, time of day, circumstances, all that kind of thing, versus if I was just like, let's say, reading an email verbatim. You know what I mean? Because those finer details and nuances, you're not going to pick up in an email. You, you get that from talking to them, the inflection in their voice when they're talking about their encounter, whether there was a comical moment or, you know, a outright deadly type of feeling that they felt. You know, there, there was a federal investigator, his name's Robert Johnson. He, he shared his name willingly. Uh, his videos, Unknown Fear and Denali, right? So when I talked to him, uh, he said, you can use my name because I didn't see anything. He, he was at the White Moose Lodge in Healy, Alaska, just right there at Denali. Uh, he was on a motorcycle trip uh, visiting his son or whatever. He ended up having to stay there because of heavy rain. But there was a banging on the back of that hotel. That scared him. Now, this is a, an investigator, anti-terror, been to the sandbox, as he put it, uh, you know, counterterrorism, well-trained, been through the trenches with, you know, combat vet, basically. And this thumping, this banging on the back of this hotel scared him to his core. He said he didn't understand it because he didn't see anything, but just the presence of this thing and feeling the the, the power behind the banging on the wall it scared him uh and to me that speaks volumes if if someone that's been through something like that can be scared to their core like a little child who's been through that 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 to me it it, it, it says a lot about the creature we're dealing with up here it, it's not your forest friend they're not here to help you with anything uh type of type of creature you know, and, and that that's one of the, the driving forces on why I want to share Alaskan experiences is because what we deal with up here is far removed from some of the encounters you may hear about down in the States. You know, it, it's a totally different environment. I, I think they're more aggressive because the the seasons up here are so short. Uh, it's already in the fall. It, it, it's already been below freezing, you know, in the mornings already. Um because of that short cycle we have up here, I, I think they're a lot more vicious because of the limited resources that can be attained in that short amount of time. So you get a lot of encounters from moose hunters, caribou hunters, salmon fishermen, berry pickers. You know, it, every resource people go out to attain up here is is typically an encounter location, you know, or a potential encounter location. I get accounts all the time from the villages, uh, like the ones outside of Bethel, uh, Russian Mission, Mountain Village, you know, places like this where out berry picking, these things have been known to try to lure women away, you know, with this slow motion wave. Uh, I've had a, a young lady in her early 20s share with me not too long ago where they were just checking the conditions of the berries to see if they're almost right for picking her and her little cousin. And they're in the wide open, wide open tundra, nothing around. They get to this, uh, it was basically a horseshoe shaped trail. They get to the apex of it roughly. And all of a sudden there's this hairy man about 70 ish feet away, roughly. And initially she said she was almost in a trance like state, like she felt, peaceful with this thing waving at her and she's on a four-wheeler with her little cousin so she the trail they were on was well defined you know you, you got your your trenches from the tread tires of the many four-wheelers that have been through there before and she veered off and she bumped her knee getting off of that trail and it snapped her out of that trance and she saw it for what it was and realized the danger and you know get out of there so you get accounts like that, like, what are we really dealing with? It's something that can put you in a trance-like state, you know, especially the vulnerable women and children. It's it's real creepy, man. It, you know, and I got no answer for it. It's just creepy stuff. Have you ever heard of people being uh, lured by the sound of a baby crying in the woods? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've heard the baby crying myself. You have. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, my cousin, Elizabeth Osterhaus, uh, now Elizabeth Cook, uh, back in 1967 or 69, one of the two, 
Uh, she lived down on Unalaska Island. No trees. It's a windswept Dutch Harbor. You know, it's just windswept. You may get some scrub brush, but that's it. Uh, they had a neighbor, a young native woman who had a child out of wedlock at the time with a fisherman. The fisherman went away and she was left with this baby. And so she would always ask for help from her neighbors and whatnot. But this baby's cry, everyone knew it because it was a colicky young baby and the mom didn't know what it was doing. You know, she was doing and so she would ask for help. And it was going in the dust, getting dark. And they heard this baby crying outside. They knew the cry and they recognized it. Well, they go outside, her and another cousin, to look to see what was going on with the baby crying, you know, making sure the baby didn't need help. And they get outside, they go around, they don't see anything. And they're going back into their little apartment. And right in front of the bay window, 10 feet away, looking at him is this hairy man imitating that baby cry to a T to perfection it she said that it, it sounded identical to the baby cry now to me that's a level of cunning that is just unreal because they're, they're literally using a woman's natural instinct against them they're using that baby cry to lure them out that's man that is some cunning stuff man just just cunning I don't, and uh, yeah I, go ahead no, I, I just, it just boggles my mind, you know, and that's why we're raised up here. Uh, you know, there's nothing good that comes. We, we were never raised to follow them. We were never raised to track them. So w when I got into this YouTube thing and I started going to look around, it was hard for me to get into it because culturally in the way I was raised for so many years, we didn't follow. We, we didn't we weren't out to, you know, take photos of tracks because we saw them often enough. You know, we weren't out to capture video footage because we seen them often enough. It, it wasn't, it wasn't on our to-do list. It wasn't a big deal. It, it was just what it was, you know. So it's been kind of a, a strange transition doing what I'm doing now. Uh, it, it, it's it's just different because culturally, the way I was raised, it's it's uh, night and day difference because I still talk to elders that are like, you know, they'll tell me, you know, better than to go look for them. You know, nothing, nothing good will come of it. And, you know, I hate their warnings, but yet I feel it's important. I, I feel it's a public safety issue. You know, people go out there. You know, I, I've talked to hunters, man, that have been going to the same spot for 40 plus years, never had an issue, never heard nothing crazy, never seen nothing crazy, but one 20 minute experience and they will never go back there again. They've given up hunting. They, they won't even go out in the woods because it's just one random encounter. And, and that's all it takes. And, and that's another thing that boggles my mind is the randomness. You can have a group of a hundred guys go to the same spot every year for their caribou. None of them have an issue. Then one year, one of them will have an issue. Their caribou gets taken. They, they have a sighting or whatever, and, and it's done for them. They, they no longer go hunting. You know, it's just so random in nature. Mm. It, it's yeah. I want to address something really quick. If listeners heard me have like an interesting reaction a, a little bit ago, I just was having such just the, 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 the picture I had in my mind of the, the hairy man imitating the baby cry and the person seeing that actually happen. That's just, that's something that man, even if you're imagining it, that I can't imagine actually seeing that in person. That's not, a good thing to see. Hmm. No, not at all. And, hmm. and she's in her late eighties now, and she still, she still gets an expression on her face of uh, almost like shell shock about it, hmm. you know. And that happened back in '69. You know what I mean? Like the, these. Okay, uh, with my channel, I, I share people's encounters, and the, the way I do it is the way I was raised, we have an oral history, an oral tradition. We don't write things down. We just pass it down, you know, verbally. And so that's why I, I treat the encounters. If anyone watches my channel, they know what I'm talking about. I, I, I try to bring the listener into that moment. And 
that's what our elders did with us. You know, whether it be, oh, caribou hunting, we were up here, we took the third slough on the right, and you go up past the berry patches, you get into the scrub brush, and, you know, you'll find the caribou back over there. You, you know, the level of detail we were raised with when sharing information with each other was, it wasn't too, oh, I'm going to share all the details. It was life and death. You know what I mean? It had to be accurate information. And that's why I get upset with those who claim oral history is just that. It's a, it's fanciful, it's folklore, it's mythology, you know, that kind of that kind of crap. That That's so inaccurate. Uh, our oral tradition and our oral history allowed us to live this long. I mean, Cambridge was what, built in 1692, Harvard? Okay, the first brick and mortar that everyone touts, you know, their education from. Well, our oral history goes back a millennia past that, you know, even further. So, you know, when the educated get this idea that, well, because they learned something in a book, therefore it has more relevance and validation versus something that was passed on orally, I scoff at that. That That's the level of arrogance that is just, I just don't, I don't go for that crap. You know what I mean? Because it's it's dismissive. You know, they they want to they want to call it archaic. You know, uh, whatever, and, and just chalk it up to folklore, and that's not the case. Mm. It's it's not the case at all. That's extremely interesting. I've never thought of it that way before, but that is that is very very cool, um, Fred. So you mentioned earlier how there are these times in your early childhood where you, you know, experience, um, things and, and saw things there, were there times also in your, as you got into adulthood where, you know, you had experiences that kind of cemented it into your mind, uh, at an older age as well. Oh yes. Yeah, several different times, but oh, okay. But let me break down for you. So, sure. We would see them at a distance on a regular basis. Now, I'm not saying every day, but on a regular enough basis, we would see them at a distance. And usually what would happen in those occurrences would they would either run off or scream at us and break something. We would run off and it was always at a distance. It, it was never like right up on us, except for a few times in passing. But it was always uh just inside a vehicle, just inside a house, things like that, to where they would they would typically leave or we would leave. Uh, in 95, we, uh, me and my cousin Spencer and a couple of the people, uh, we were looking for woodland caribou. They're a little bigger than your standard caribou, what you would call a reindeer. And we were, we were checking these alpine meadows where some locals said, hey, they mill around up there. If you go up there and look, you, you'll probably find one. So we wanted one. And so we're up there on foot. Uh, we, had, we had beached our skiff and we walked up this hill and they're sloping kind of like steps as we're going up to each of these little alpine meadows. And we got up to the upper, the most upper one in this portion of the, uh, basically the Wood River Mountains. And we got up to this step and it was a lot of grass and muskeg, just the, the beginnings of like a probably an ancient beaver pond, I would guess, because of how the land lay. But it was all grass through there, and there was trees off to our right-hand side about 80 yards away, roughly. And these are black spruce, so they're not very big, and, you know, they're just, you know, they were there. Well, when we get up there, there was no wind, and the grass was about four foot tall. And so we're, we're looking around for a sign of caribou, and the wind blew from behind us and started, you know, the, the grass moved like you would see a wave crash against the beach, you know what I mean? And this grass was moving, and this one portion didn't move. It was a female Sasquatch, and it was squatted down. And if the wind hadn't blown, we would have never seen her. But the wind blew, we noticed, and immediately she stood up because the gig was up. We saw her. She stood up. Uh, she basically had a caramel kind of dead grass color. And she was dark on the lower portion of her body. But once we saw her, she made eye contact, stood there briefly, 
and let out this scream as she ran from our left to our right uh, very fast, very, very fast. But her coloring was such that as soon as she hit those black spruce, uh, she blended in seamlessly like a, like a baby duckling in the grass. You know what I mean? Just natural camouflage made it appear that she disappeared, but she was still there. You heard her crash through the trees and stuff. And she was still bellowing and, and screaming, running away. And that was typically what we would deal with out in the bush. It, typically, you know, some, sometimes villagers will say it stole my fish or, or this and that, you know, but, it never, for the most part, you didn't hear about outright attacks, right? Uh, when you did, it was always second, third hand. Uh, you know, so and so went missing. You know, hairy man attack or whatever. And you didn't disbelieve. You just basically thought, oh, well, at least it wasn't me. You know, kind of, kind of frame of thought. Up until 2006, I would have told you. They scream, they break stuff, you leave, they throw stuff every once in a while, they may come around your house, but they eventually leave, just leave them alone. You know, that that was my mindset up until 06. And what happened in 2006 is it, it actually started in 04 when my uncle, uh, he wanted to go golf prospecting and he knew he had to get portable sluice box you know everything portable because you know we had limited capacity in a 22 foot skip and he wanted to be efficient and so it took a couple seasons for him to cure all this stuff and in 06 at the end of the fishing season uh he said this is the year do you got the time i said sure do uncle you know just just name the time well he wanted to leave september 12th and, and that's my birthday so I asked if we could leave the 13th so I could be in civilization, at least some part of civilization for my, my 31st birthday. You know, and he was like, okay, we'll leave the 13th. So we left Dillingham the 13th of September in 2006, and we launched from Squaw Creek, and we went up the Nooshkak River. And it's roughly 248 river miles to the Nooyakuk River where we were going. And that was a couple days process because my uncle was in his mid to late sixties at that time and he would get cold on the water. So we stopped in Mustilia Hawk, visited with family for a day or so, and then went up river, refueled at Kaliganik, and then continued on up to the Nuya Cup. And we we got to the Nuya Cup uh September seventeenth. And it was a couple hours before dark. We had got there and me and my cousin, we wanted to run up and down the river real quick and just check things out. But because it was getting late and we had the boat to unload, we opted to wait till the next day. So we unload everything and we, we weren't loud. We weren't boisterous. We weren't parting it up or just randomly shooting guns off in the woods or anything like that. We just unloaded the skiff and went into this little salmon counting tower shack. Uh, it was eight foot square. Everything was made with minimal cutting because in, in remote Alaska, by state law, you can't have any permanent structures. So this thing was on skids. So it's an eight foot square. It's five eighths plywood on two by four studs, minimal construction. I mean, bare minimum is basically a dried in shell. And on the back side of this place was a 50 style egg still kind of looking camper. You know, the kind I'm talking about a little toe behind. Well, yes. The front of that had been cut off and mounted to the back side of this little shack, and it, all the windows were blacked out in that back portion. Yeah, it was a bunk bunk area because the land of the midnight sun, it, it stays light out damn near day, you know, day and night. And so, <clears throat> and when you step in the door, as you come up the bank, it, it's about twenty feet to the front of this place, and it's about a six, seven foot. Uh, climb because it's on a cut bank to get to the you know to the top of the bank there and when you're looking at the place if you're looking directly at it from the front the door is to the left hand side of it there's an old oil drum stand to the right hand side and again this is only eight foot wide and so when you open this door it's flimsy it's two by four on five eighths plywood all it had was this little j hook to keep the door shut and a little bit of a so old piece of driftwood screwed into the, the two by four as a handle. So 
when you step in, there's a little card table immediately to your left, right there, and an 18 by 20 inch window right above it. And mirroring that window across on the other side was a, a little miniature sink, a little tiny sink that drained right to the outside, and another 18 by 24 inch window on that side. And then you got the little entryway dead center on the back side that went into this 50 style trailer. <laughs> so we get in there. We unload everything, and uh, my uncle cooks for us. He he made some some salmon head chowder, and and whatnot. And we had gotten done eating, and that year I had spent some of my fishing money on a brand new Remington 870 shotgun. It was a rifled barrel. It was gonna be my slug gun, you know, just a gun for the brush. And I, I was real happy with it. But the rear sight, I was trying to adjust it. And because uh, I had shot it a couple times going up river, and I noticed that the sight was off a little bit. So I, as I was doing the adjustments, uh, at this point in time, my my uncle and my cousin are playing cribbage at this little table, and we got a Coleman lantern going because it's about a half hour after dark at this point. And as we're sitting there talking, my uncle's giving us instruction on, you know, I want a couple buckets of pay dirt from over here that I want to try to sample and this and that because his overall goal was to basically stake a claim. And this is just south of the proposed pebble mine, which is, uh, according to what they say, the largest gold and copper reserves in the world. Okay, so there, there's a reason for that because there's gold everywhere over there, right? So that his, his idea was to basically start a gold mine, but, you know, just start small and, and see what we could find. It was his line of thinking. So he's given us instruction on where he wants the buckets and this and that. And I'm still dinking with this rear sight. Well, as, as he's talking, all of a sudden, the whole place kind of shifts. It just made this creaking kind of sound, right? And so there was no wind blowing because, again, this is just a glorified box. We would have known that the wind was blowing. You know what I mean? And there was no wind blowing. So when I look over at my cousin... Where he's sitting, he's got the window behind him. And between his shoulder and the top of that window, I saw a dark movement. And I, the way I looked over there, he, he jumps up and says, hey, that ain't funny. And I was like, no, no, there was movement. So we're on a salmon river, right? There was spawn outs in the river as we're coming up, you know. So we immediately thought there. I mean, it, it was the only thing that made sense. Hairy man wasn't on our, our mind. It, it had... Because it was around, we just, superstition wise, when it comes to most villagers, they don't talk about it because it could bring a bad omen. And so there's a lot of superstition involved. So it was nothing we actually openly talked about a lot of times. So he grabs a 30 odd six. I got that shotgun and we had one of those million candle watt powered, uh, like six volt spotlights, right? Fresh battery in it. We open that door. And to our right would be the river bank, and to our left, about 50 yards away, would be the tree line. <laughs> and so immediately I point to the side where we saw the movement, well, where I saw the movement. There's nothing there, and we beam towards our left. And we're only about a, a, a step outside of this door, maybe a foot and a half. We're shoulder to shoulder. We got guns ready. We're, we're going to scare this bear off. And as I pan to the left, once we hit the tree line to our left, uh, we come across three sets of eye shine and, and the eye shine was red. Uh, we could see these creatures. They, the root, their eyes were huge. Um, they reminded me of fence post markers, you know, those three inch fence post markers. They were, they were that big and immediately like shock took over. It, it seemed, uh, it was ominous, uh, an instant feeling of dread, because typically from what we've experienced before, you beam a flashlight at them, they kind of duck behind a tree, they kind of try to hide themselves. Well, these three didn't move. They just stood there. So we duck right back inside, and I shut that little J-hook. And what was really weird is it felt like we put on earmuffs as soon as we went in back inside and I shut that little J-hook. It was like everything was muffled. We, I was talking, 
and it's you, you know have you ever been on a plane where your ears haven't fully popped so the person sitting next to you sounds like you know they're right yep. there oh, but yeah. they sound kind of far away oh yeah it, it was that kind of feeling and so i'm talking and i i'm, I'm talking to my cousin i was like you see, and i as i'm talking to my cousin about you saw what i saw right and i tell him my uncle there's a hairy man out there there's three of them as i'm saying that uh within a moment my, my cousin's on my, on my left shoulder and he's holding the barrel of that 30 odd six with his hands kind of like just down he had the butt of the gun down between his feet i had just set the spotlight down and i'm holding that shotgun in my left hand kind of off-handed trying to trying to discuss what we're seeing and all of a sudden my cousin is bam underneath that card table uh had a death grip on that barrel and, and he's kind of uh, moving his arms up and down like he was turning butter a little bit. And he had wet himself and was just kind of not not writhing around, but kind of twitchy a little bit. And he's looking the op- uh, towards the opposite side, towards that window. But me and my uncle look at each other. We look down at him. We look back at each other. And we realize he's looking across the little room to that other window by the sink. So I'm literally about three feet from this window. And we both turn at the same time. And once I made eye contact with this, well, once my eyes made contact with this thing, I could tell it was looking at my cousin. But as soon as I was looking at it, it turned its gaze at me and furled its brow. Uh, I only saw from the bottom of its nose to the top of its eyebrow in that 18 inch space. It had ash gray skin. Uh, its eyes were like black translucent marbles. Um, there was a slight glow to them from the Coleman lantern, but it wasn't like a full on eye shine. It, it was a little dulled down. <laughs> Within two milliseconds, I, I immediately knew what it felt like to be prey. I, I knew what it felt like to be the rabbit in the hole with the wolf outside. It, it wasn't no mind speak. It was in the air. It, it was something about the energy in the air was that of death. Like, you know, and, and the way it looked at me and, and furled its brow to kind of like glare right at me uh, within milliseconds. I, it's taken way longer to explain it than how it happened because I turned. It gave me that look. And it started moving out of view of the window towards my right. And I just shot through the wall right there three times with that shotgun. And what was weird is, is I discharged a shotgun in the small room and there was no ringing of the ears. It just sounded like a thump, thump, thump uh, because of that pressure that the, and this pressure I'm referring to it, it stayed the whole time during this whole encounter. So it, it was constant. It, it didn't vary. It didn't get less or heavier. It was a constant. But so I shoot the three times and immediately there is a scream and a simultaneous shift of this place. And, you know, I thought it was going to push us in the river. Uh, just, I mean, we we're less than 20 feet from the bank. You know, I, I really thought we we're going in the river, but there's this scream that was so loud. It shook everything in there that pot that the stew was made in it rang like a tuning fork from the screen the lantern was swinging it almost took me off my feet and everything went quiet uh there was no more sound uh my cousin wasn't responding my uncle said a couple things but he basically went and sat in the bunk room there and i'm freaking out um i i was yelling at them to help me um I, I was, I felt all alone and I'm amongst some of the most hardcore subsistence hunters that I have ever known. You know, um, my cousin, for example, he was shoulder to shoulder with me with a charging sow, uh, you know, over 800 pound female brown bear charging us. He stood his ground and to see him he had wet himself he's babbling underneath the table and my uncle isn't engaging me and so i knew 
it wasn't over. Like something within me, I, I knew we couldn't just, oh, okay, let's call it a night, start fresh in the morning kind of thing. Cause it, that wasn't what was happening. The energy was very ominous. It was dead quiet. So what I ended up doing was, is I slid one of the chairs over by that stupid little flimsy door for whatever good that would do. And I took the other chair and I put it right at the opening of that little cubby. And I basically sat there in that chair, listening to that Coleman lantern hiss. Uh, I don't know if you've ever dealt with them, the white gas Coleman lantern. You got to pump them every once in a while. But I, I sat there for, gosh, had to have been five, six hours, uh, periodically asking for help. Um, the only the only reason I was able to stop shaking like uncontrollably was I I resigned myself to death. I I, am, I had to literally uh, I'm a dead man. I had to accept it, and I had to, and that was the only way I could rationally think. Um, I staged a bunch of ammo. I tried to get the 30 out six for my cousin, but it was loaded and he wasn't letting go. He still wasn't responding. He was still in la la land. Like, and my uncle was basically shut down. Uh, he wasn't saying much. He had his Bible. He was being quiet. Um, he had basically no advice to offer and he was, he wasn't engaging whatsoever. And so I sat there pumping that lantern every once in a while. I, I was gripping that shotgun so hard that it, it hurts my hands. Uh, I, I would have to let go and shake life back in my hands because it, it, my hands, I was gripping it so hard. And, you know, when a moth would hit the window, oh my God. Uh, there were several times I almost switched cheese that place from the inside out just when a moth hit the window. Uh, there was moments of time where I was just screaming out loud, you know, effing come get me, you know, uh, various things just, it, it was rough. Uh, because I was there with two other people I loved, but no one was helping me, you know. And so, uh, and I'm guesstimating because I was in fits of terror, you know, uh, so the time frame of how long I sat there without my cousin responding I, i'm guessing five to six hours it, it give or take because again uh I, I wasn't fully in my right mind but i knew in my heart of hearts i couldn't just go lay down and call it a night it, i just shot this thing through the wall and i don't know what else is coming you know uh we saw the three sets of eye shine this one was looking at the in the window at us so I, I knew it was it was going on. It, whatever was happening was happening, and it's going to be what it's going to be kind of thing. Once my cousin did start coming out of his stupor, um, and it, it took a while uh, because he, he was incoherent. He was babbling stuff, uh, stuff that made no sense, gibberish. But once he, once he was back more to himself and I got him talking, uh, we got him changed. And I got him calmed down enough, you know, by reassuring him, I shot it, man, it ran away. I shot it, it's gone. And, and you know, that helped, it, it, it brought peace and calm to him a little bit, but it, we were still in the middle of it, you know? And I asked him, I was like, what did you see? And once he pulled himself together, he told me that it showed him his teeth. And from what he said, when he was standing next to me and I was talking, he looked out that window and there was enough of the light from the, the lantern that he saw it. It was a little further away from the window and it showed his teeth and his body shut down. And he said when he was under the table looking, he was trying to tell us, but nothing would come out. He was just seizing up basically. But that's when it came in closer to the window. And that's when we turned and I saw it. And so we, we, realized we need to get out of there. Uh, it was not going to, you know, it, it, we didn't want to be there. It, it was all bad. So we came up with a game plan. We were going to make it to the skip, which is 25 feet away. You know, it, it seemed like 10 miles away at the time, but it was literally just not very far. And we were going to drift out of there 
until we got further down river because it was pitch black. You know, there was no way to fire up the outboard and safely navigate the river. It, you know, there's too many deadfall trees, there's rocks, there's all sorts of things that could go wrong on that. So we were going to use the spotlight, our initial plan to basically keep ourselves going, you know, downstream and, you know, use the oars to kind of steer or whatever. That was our initial plan. And so we're, we're sitting there quiet for a while. And as we're getting up, because it was so quiet, we were getting more brave. We were getting more courage to make this move. And my cousin brings up, let's use the spotlight and see if there's anything outside we can see. So we shut off the lantern because it was creating a mirrored effect inside. Uh, it, you know what I mean? And so with it being pitch black outside, the light inside just made the windows look like mirrors. So we killed that and we beamed out the riverside first and we took a really good look. It, we saw nothing on that side. And believe me, we were really, really looking. And so we went to the other side and we started at the point we saw the three sets of eye shine and we're, we're beaming and we see nothing. I, I mean, there's nothing. It's quiet, dead quiet. And this this beam, this spotlight had a fresh battery. So it's not like, you know, it, it didn't have the, the candela. It, it was bright. And we beam in there off kitty corner off the back side of this shack about 40 feet. There's this old outhouse that long out of use, but it was about eight, eight and a half foot tall. It was built with minimal cuts and it had a one sided roof, but at its highest point, it was about eight, eight and a half feet tall. Once we beam back to that point, we noticed this big hulking silhouette behind it. It wasn't immediately behind it. It was kind of back a little bit from it. But this silhouette was every bit of 13 to 14 foot tall. It was hulking five, five and a half foot wide. Uh, it's black. The creepiest thing, its size was immense, but the it was absorbing the light. It was giving nothing back, no eye shine. Even a black bear, if you beam it with a flashlight at night, it has kind of like that silky kind of chrome copper, you know, kind of reflection to its to its hide. This gave nothing. It was like it was absorbing all the light. It was it was like a big black nothing there for us. So it started moving a little bit towards our right, we immediately killed that spotlight and we're all tucked back into that little cubby, pitch black. Uh, we, we were freaking out. We, I, I know we had the barrels crossed because I kept hearing the barrel of my shotgun butting against the barrel of the 30-06. And, and we stayed like that for, gosh, quite a while. Again, no, just dead quiet. All we saw was that menacing hulking figure and we hid and we heard nothing. <laughs> so after a while it being dead quiet we, we started reformulating our game plan and as we're going over it and stuff off in the near distance it, it sounded like a uh, rotor wash from a helicopter that bump 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 sound well we started feeling it in the ground and what it was was one of these things running by the shack um and it as soon as it ran by, because we, we felt it in the ground, and as soon as it ran by, it was like other ones were surrounding the place, and they started running around as well. It, I don't know if they were trying to draw our fire or see if we were going to shoot again or just outright terrorize us. I, I don't know. But they ran around, and then they would. it seemed like they would back off, and then they would do it again. And this, this continued, uh, gosh, I... Uh, in the moment, it seemed like about roughly 15 minutes, <clears throat> give or take, because we were white knuckle terror uh, listening to this. And at one point, uh, as the running was going on, it sounded like one of them was sniffing the little trailer attachment to the shack. And it's, it's hard to express the level of, of sheer terror like we were, we were stuck, you know? Uh, and again, you know, one of my driving forces or factors that, you know, propel me forward to share people's encounters is 
they had us dead to rights. They could have smashed that place to nothing in a heartbeat and snatched us out of there, but yet they didn't. They could have, but they didn't. Um, anyway, j- just something that dwells on my mind a lot when I think about it is what they could have done, yet they didn't. But anyway, so that goes on for a little while, and then they back off, and it gets quiet, like super quiet again. And again, I don't know exactly how much time transpired, but it was starting to get the first glimmers of it getting lighter outside. And with it being quiet for so long, again, we we were getting our courage up. We had our game plan down. And it dawned on me at that point that we drug the anchor and, and bow line from that skiff 50 to 70 yards. It was a long bow line because that skiff was used for a set net site. And so your anchor had to be long enough to hook the bottom and still uh, not get swamped when high tide came in, right? So we had taken that anchor when we first got there and drug it back over onto the tundra and dug it into the tundra. So we're basically tethered into the place. And luckily, just 10 foot of that bow line was chained, and then it went to a regular rope. And so I told my cousin, you know, when you go first, you're going to have to cut that bow line, and I'll make sure that, you know, your dad follows behind me and I'll, I'll keep a guard while you start the outboard and all that stuff. Right. That, that was our game plan. And so we're sitting there and we're just getting our courage up because it's getting lighter out. And all of a sudden that same side of the wall that the door's on the front side, it sounded like a pellet gun shooting it. At first it was just a, a that, that sound. Right. And then the cadence increased to where, and then all of a sudden it was like a hailstorm against that side. So again, immediately we retreated back into that cubby. Uh, barrels crossed again. Like what the hell? It was like every time we were getting up the gumption to make a break for it, it was almost like they sensed it and they would do something to terrorize us. It, it, I felt toyed with. I, I really felt like cat and mouse type of shit. And so that that still bothers me to this day anyway so we're, we're in this cubby and we're all being quiet and after it's quiet for a while we start whispering because it's getting lighter outside and we sat there to where it was light enough where we could easily see the tree line we couldn't really see into the trees too much because it was still silhouetted but there was enough daylight to where we could see the open ground and with it being so quiet for so long after that, we, we got our courage up. And so my cousin's in front of me, I'm in the middle, and my elder's behind me. And I have the 30 out six at this point. My cousin has his shotgun. And I have my uncle's 30 out, his 12 gauge old wingmaster, big old long goose gun. It was a 12 gauge. But I had that slung over my shoulder for more rounds if I needed them because uh, he was. In his 60s, he wasn't indolent, but he wasn't spry. You know what I mean? He kind of walked with a little bit of a hobble. So, you know, I wanted to make sure I had enough firepower on me as possible. So it's quiet. And so, you know, it's go time. So he has my pocket knife. He has to cut that bow line and jump in the skip and start it. That was our game plan. So we kick the door open and boom, we're at the edge of the bank in no time. Uh, My cousin immediately jumps down. I stopped paying attention to him because my uncle's behind me and it's a six, seven foot drop on a cut bank. So the dew on the grass and everything was a little slippery. So I had to help him get his footing so he could make it down the bank safely and not just topple over. And the way I positioned myself with his shotgun on my back, the shotgun was kind of pushing me forward the way I knelt down. So I, I scooped back about four to six inches, maybe before I stood up uh, to wait, you know, wait for my turn to get down this bank. And as I get up to full standing height, this rock, a uh, little bigger than a basketball, whizzed by the front of my face. H- had I not scooted back and I just stood up from where I was, we wouldn't have this conversation, man. As soon as that rock whizzed by in front of my face, uh, everything went slow motion and my eyes locked on that rock. And it impacted about 
uh, a part of the river that was about roughly three feet deep, fast moving water. It impacted so hard that rock hit the bottom and sounded like a shotgun blast before the water could close over it. I mean, pow. And as soon as I heard that sound, it was like those earmuffs came off and I could, I could hear clearly again. Uh, everything was still quasi slow motion, but I turned the direction the rock came from. No, this thing was coming out of the tree line 50 yards away. That rock had to have been in flight before I started standing up. You, you know what I mean? It, it was like, anyway, is I, I turned and that big black silhouette was coming out of the tree line. It still wasn't giving anything back. I could I could tell it was moving, but it was like it was gliding. And immediately with that 30 out six, I put three rounds center mass. Bam, bam, bam. And I, I heard the bullets impact this thing. Now, this 30 out six is a powerful rifle. Anyone who's hunted knows. We use the same rifle to kill walrus, bear, moose. Everything we've come up against with that rifle, we've killed it. This thing took all three rounds and all it, it didn't flinch or nothing. It just stopped moving forward. It just stopped. It, it, it didn't buckle nothing. Well, once I put those three rounds on it and it didn't do anything, I, I was getting this tunnel vision going on from the, from the shot. Everything was kind of closing in and I turn around, I jump down. Uh, Cause at this point, my, my uncle's making his way into the skiff and the bow line wasn't cut. My cousin got the motor running, but he didn't cut the bow line. So I'm yelling at him, throw me the knife, throw me the knife. He throws the knife. I set the 30 out six into the bow of the skiff and I'm cutting that line. And I'm telling him idle down, idle down. Cause he had it the idle too high to shift gears. Right. And of course it was cold and he could only do so much, but you know, it, it was a tense moment. We're kind of yelling back and forth. And as I cut the bow line and I'm putting the chain in, my uncle's kind of got his butt on the edge and he's kind of trying to shimmy in. I shoved him in. I, I felt bad later because it bruised his wrist pretty bad, but I shoved him in. And uh, when I jumped down, I noticed that my cousin had dropped my shotgun right there on the beach on this little small landing where we had the, the skip perch. And so in my mind's eye, I was going to grab my shotgun. I don't know why. I never got an answer of why he dropped my shotgun on the little beach there. But anyway, so I shoved my uncle in. I'm thinking I'm going to grab that, that shotgun. And the, the chain was hanging a little more, so I, I dumped the rest of the chain in there. And as I'm looking at him, and I'm, I'm still yelling at him to idle down, and he idles down and it shifts, right? And all of a sudden, his eyes get real big. My uncle, when he landed, he turned around and, and was looking back towards the direction of the bank. And they're both looking over my shoulder up at the bank. And I turn around, and as I'm looking up, I saw from just up to about mid-shin before I realized this thing is towering over me. And I, I push off from the, from the shore, and he kicks it in gear and, out of reverse, and we start getting up on step to get out of there. and when we were leaving, he was kind of swaying the skiff back and forth. And I thought he was just trying to get up on step. I thought he was trying to, you know, break the friction of the water to get up on step, you know, a little sooner. But what I found out many years later was he wasn't doing it to get on step. He was doing it to avoid the rocks that they were throwing at the outboard. Uh, one rock hit the transom so hard, it left a, a, a partial puncture hole in the transom. And, uh, you know, we, we skipped on out of there and it wasn't, gosh, I, I was in the bow and I'm still having this bit of everything closing in kind of tunnel vision. And I'm looking for the 220 grain bullets for the 30-06 that we, we typically would use for bear. And what was in it was 180 grain uh, core lock soft tips, you know, the deadliest mushroom in the woods up until that point anyway and we i mean that's basically where the encounter ended when we got down to where the nuyakuk and the confluence of the nushigak river met we finally uh took a minute to take a breather and 
immediately I felt like I weighed a thousand pounds, man, from up all night with the, the tense muscles and everything. And, and finally feeling like we're, we got away. Uh, I felt like I weighed a thousand pounds and that, that trip ruined our relationship because when we got back to the village, anyone with a pair of ears, I was telling them, Hey, you know, they tried to get us, you know, my uncle and cousin were there, you know, I, I was telling anyone who would listen. And my uncle was in a position at that time uh, where he didn't want it made public because of this particular position he had. And I pushed the issue. I, I inadvertently kind of did no good to our relationship either by pressing it so hard. But because of what had happened, I wanted to tell everybody, watch out. They're, they tried to get us, you know what I mean? And they were more wanting to just keep it hush hush and leave it where it was. And because of what we went through, I just, I couldn't not tell somebody and warn them, you know, and it, it, it ruined our relationship. I, I was never able to fully make amends with my uncle. He's since passed. And my cousin that was with us, uh, I talked to him once and I, I went over the encounter of what I remember of it with him and I asked him, am I leaving anything out? And that's when he told me uh, that they were throwing rocks at the outboard. But in, out of 17 years, we had one 15 minute conversation since that incident. That is, that's incredible, Fred. And thank you for putting yourself back in that must, is that hard to, to retell that? I mean, that's, um, I can't sometimes imagine. Sometimes they're easier than others. Yeah. It, there's sometimes it doesn't bother me at all. And other times I, I get caught in the emotion of it because yeah. like it, it ruined my relationship with my family we were thick as thieves man we were three peas in a pod us three were always the ones on an adventure like always it was us three were the main ones that if there was an adventure to be had we were on it and since 06 that all went away do you do you blame those creatures for for having a relationship with your relatives ruined? Uh, I can't, I, I can't blame them. I, I blame the high stress mm. and their unwillingness to like collaborate or, or uh, basically back me up. Sure. You know what I mean? Cause I felt, in that moment it was going on, I was by myself because my cousin was under the table. My uncle wasn't responsive. So it was just a further continuation of that when we got back to the village. You know, I was told I was a crazy drunk. Uh, I was told, oh, you're just making shit up for attention. Like, why in, the, why in the hell would I make that up for some attention? You know, I, I mean, I gained nothing from that. You know what I mean? There, there, I gained nothing. I lost so much. I have gained nothing from it. Have you ever been back to that area or do you never go back there? Uh, no, I, I want to go back. Uh, I want to film a documentary and mm. the documentary I want to do is going to be a cultural thing with uh, just native peoples on how our oral history from the past kind of meets up with the present, that type of thing. Um, I haven't fully worked it out, but that place is going to be the the pinnacle of that documentary. You know what I mean? That it's going to revolve around that spot. But logistically, it is a nightmare to get there. Uh, it was expensive for us, and we lived in Dillingham. You know what I mean? So for me to go from where I'm at now back to Dillingham... For the same price, I could go to Hawaii twice. Wow. <laughs> That's wild, man. <laughs> yeah. So it's, yeah, it's a logistical 
a logistical thing. And I sure as hell ain't going by myself. Uh, I, I need to bring some qualified people. Not that my relatives weren't. They were the most qualified I could think of even to this day that I know of personally, but everyone's different. You know, uh, I wasn't a hero in, in that moment. When I made eye contact with that thing, man, I wasn't going, Oh, I'm going to shoot now. I'm going to protect us. No, it was get off me, get, you know, get off me. It was, it was nothing heroic. It was self-preservation. It, in that moment, when I started shooting through the wall, initially, my uncle and cousin didn't even exist in my mind in that moment. It, it was such a shock to my system. It was like every fiber of my being wanted to flee, but it was stuck in my skin. It, it was like an electrical charge, like a just a shock. Mm, it's, it, it's probably one of the most intense... I would say it is the most intense encounter I've ever heard, Fred. That that is incredible that you guys actually survived that, and and thankfully you did. Man. Well, yeah, and that's another reason I had the channel. I, I also have a website, subarticalaskasasquatch.com. I have an interactive map of Alaska, and you can zoom in on an area, and there's marker pins, and if you touch the marker pin, it's uh, – or you click on it, it's embedded with my YouTube channel. So it'll bring up the encounter video from that area. So fellow Alaskans or people traveling here can, and let's say they're going to Kenai Peninsula, they're going to be by Ski Lake Lake, let's say, just as an example. They could zoom in on the map, see the Ski Lake Lake, touch a pin, and they could hear an encounter someone had had from that area, not to scare them away, but to make them aware. It's like bear aware signs, be aware of the bear. You know, I, it frustrates me that so many people have these encounters, but yet it's treated like, oh, they're they're making up a story for attention. Man, no one needs this kind of attention. You know what I mean? It, it's not it's not a badge of honor. But what drives me is no one asked for it. No one asked to be accosted by this big thing out in the woods when they're doing their day to day shit. No one asked for that. You know what I mean? And so. Uh, I, I'm biased, though. I don't trust them for nothing. And when I hear what I consider fanciful, happy-go-lucky stories about my forest friend, I, I ain't my friend. I, mm. I, 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 I could never be comfortable with one near me ever again. And I can't honestly say that if one wasn't near me, I wouldn't just open fire on it. But that's that's my own personal bias. And so I leave that out of the encounters I share from people. I just share what they shared with me. I don't put a spin on it. I I just I I give what I was given. You know what I mean? And I leave my personal bias out of it. Uh, There is a guy, Dan, he shared an experience where he was rescued by a female near the Golcana River back when he was 10. And I asked him, I was like, man, that's pretty cool. I haven't heard anything positive. So, you know, how did you feel? And his words were, I felt like they were trying to get rid of me because of the search and rescue efforts. They had helicopters, small planes, you know, the troopers out in mass looking for him. And he he said he didn't feel good about it. He felt like they're getting rid of the nuisance versus really being helpful. Wow. This has been an incredible conversation, Fred. As we start to head towards the end of our time together, do you have any words for people that might be thinking, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find a Bigfoot this weekend? Do you have any any words of advice Uh, of how they should maybe change their thinking a little bit. I would say, be careful of what you wish for. Um, and it's not going to be what you think. It's not, it's not going to be a harmonious, uh, whatever may be going through your mind. Don't, don't go in naive. They're, they're not our, in my, now this is my opinion. They're not our forest friends. 
uh, and I can only speak for Alaska because I know it's different down in the States. There's a different level of aggression. Uh, just be careful what you wish for. You, you don't want what you think you do. You really don't. Uh, there's, there's a level of, understanding that you're lacking and you don't want that. Um, nothing good is going to come of it. There's so many people that have had encounters who had a camera in their hand and did nothing with the camera. They were so in shock. If you have a weak heart, be prepared because you may need a defib. Um, it's not what you think it's going to be it's not going to be that exciting oh yay moment no it, it, it is life-altering terrifying some wise words from someone who has had uh, multiple encounters themselves fred thank you so much for coming on and sharing what has happened to you do you mind taking a few more minutes and sharing with people how they can keep up to date uh, with subarctic Alaska Sasquatch and uh, what's the best way to do that? Uh, yeah. I mean, I have uh, a couple email accounts that could easily be found in the description of the channel. Um, I leave my phone number and, you know, people can contact me that way uh, during daylight hours, Alaska. If you're on the East coast, I'm four hours behind. So, you know, wherever you may be, just keep that in mind. Uh, I've gotten calls at, you know, three in the morning and it's 7 a.m. Someone's having their coffee and they're waking me up, you know, just to ask some questions. I, I don't mind the questions. I, I put my number out there for a reason. Uh, but I'm, I'm easy to find, man. I, I'm really not hard. You know, uh, Alaskan Harry Man Project at gmail.com or no comp 907 at gmail.com or, you know, my phone number, which is, is listed in the opening of my most current video so uh, i'm easy to find and i upload content when i can i i live in alaska so i'm in winter prep mode and you know i got background stuff going on but i'm, I'm very easy to find you know if if an 80 something year old woman in new orleans can find me then anyone can there you go man <laughs> it is it is incredible the uh the type of people that uh, find, uh, people like us. I, I totally agree with that, but, um, we appreciate it. And Fred, thank you so much for coming on. I hope to be talking to you again sometime in the future, but, uh, uh, keep doing what you're doing, man. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. And thanks for having me on.